linguists have developed theories of how people acquire language in which frequency of occurrence plays a major role. Frequency is one of the most reliable predictors of human behavior. What you do often, you do better and with fewer errors. This is also true of language, both of your mother tongue and of any languages that you learn later in life. Why is this so? Well, this is because frequency effects are memory effects, and knowledge of a language is a memory, however strange that may sound. By understanding how memory works and taking into account what our brains like and do not like, teachers can develop teaching methods that take advantage of these insights and students can develop more efficient ways of learning. So when psychologists study memory, what we look for is regularities, things that reliably predict whether something is remembered or forgotten. And we know a few things, and one of the things that is most reliable is uh, frequency of encounter. So how often you've seen a thing or practiced a thing will relate to how strong the memory is or how well developed the skill is. This relationship between frequency and memory uh, it has a well-known function in terms of skill acquisition. So skills are, are memories for abilities, memories for doing something. And we all know the learning curve, which is a relationship between how often you practice something and how well you know it. And this has a very familiar function. As you start to practice something, you get better rapidly, but then it gets harder and harder to improve. So the learning curve slows down. That's why it's a curve. The influence of frequency on how we teach language to second language learners is an interesting one and it's a very complicated one because, well, the frequency data that we have tends to talk about the material that native speakers have. But of course, what native speakers have or use in their daily lives may not be what's of interest or use to a second language speaker. So they may be very interested in talking about politics and the Euro um, or philosophy, but that's not going to do you any good um, as a first-year student of a language. What you want to learn at that point is all the stuff that doesn't crop up in a large database of stuff. You want to learn how to say hello, goodbye, you want to negotiate certain transactions, typically commercial ones, and so if we just went by frequency, you'd end up learning an awful lot of stuff um, that wasn't particularly useful to you. So there's been a bit of an effort recently to focus in on what types of situations would it be useful to look at, to extract the frequency from those and then use that for language learners. So thinking a little bit about memory, practice, um, frequency, um, I do think frequency is um, important for language acquisition um, and it is something that I use in my classes and actually which I encourage students to develop for themselves. Um, so I, I make sure with my first year students in language classes that keywords we met last week or keywords we met three days ago, I will introduce them again. Coming across a word once and then never again means that you will uh, perhaps acquire it for the five minutes you need it, but otherwise it'll go again. Using it is important, so repeating it yourself and using it in a, in a, in a, in a sentence, or in a, in a, that's important. So psychologists who study memory and linguists with expertise in foreign language teaching agree. Frequency has the effect it has because our memories are sensitive to how elements are presented over time. Our brains are not very good at storing lots of information in a very short period of time, but they are very good at retaining information to which we are exposed regularly. A second thing to bear in mind is that memories are easier to form and maintain if there is context to support them. And context is meant very broadly here. Basically, it means the setting, the circumstances, the environment in which you learn. And the environment is the aspect that differs most markedly between first and second language acquisition. There's, there's a whole body of research that shows that what we call kind of teaching discourse is very different from natural discourse. So when I'm in a classroom, the interaction tends to center, whether you like it or not, on the teacher. It tends to settle on the teacher. So the students say things to the teacher, the teacher then sometimes approves their discourse, sends it back to them in a slightly corrected form, and the students do less interaction with each other. We try to make up for this. We try to challenge it to get students to work more with each other, but there's no getting around the fact that 
uh, a classroom situation is to a certain extent an artificial one. So it is actually really important for students to get the experience of speaking with native speakers. And this, this is something actually really dangerous because in a classroom, it's safe, right? What goes on stays within those walls. You're talking primarily to your teacher or to other non-native speakers. And when misunderstandings occur, they're corrected. When you speak to a native speaker, that's not happening, right? Things can go wrong. You can say the wrong thing. You can get embarrassed. People speak fast and they don't necessarily adapt their language for you. But it's a very exciting and it opens up your ears much more, I think, than the classroom situation because you start listening to what people say in your environment and you pick up all sorts of things. Again, it depends very much on what type of language learner you are. A lot of people um, find the structured stuff more meaningful. The structured stuff will be more helpful to them, certainly to start with. There's others that are far more intuitive and, and, and listen more and start uh, they're more like sponges, if you like, and take on the environment more. I think th there are absolutely um, clear benefits to immersing yourself and learning a language in a way in which native speakers have acquired that language, i.e. by immersion, although you know, second language learners are, are never actually replicating the whole experience of an L1, of a first um, language learner. But by living in the country and interacting with native speakers, you do an awful lot more practice because you're having to do this day in and day out and you become much more attuned to the ways in which people naturally use the language, the way they put words together or the way they don't put words together which would, no they don't put this word with that word, there's no reason why, they, why you shouldn't, you just don't. It's learning that kind of thing. That's not to say I don't think the classroom has its place. I do think the classroom has its place. And what the classroom offers, that perhaps the interaction day in a constant way with native speakers, what the classroom does is it actually is a point where you intervene very specifically. We know that there are certain things that non-native speakers find difficult. We can focus on those in the classroom. We can create opportunities for that structure, that sound, to be encountered by learners in a way that it wouldn't come up naturally if you were just interacting in a normal way alongside native speakers. We can then take the time to step back and reflect. We can make a mistake and use it as an opportunity to learn something rather than an opportunity to get embarrassed because we've said the wrong thing in the wrong kind of context. I can tell you that there are really good reasons in terms of the way information is processed in our brains that mean you have to fail to learn most efficiently because those failures, although they're demotivating, provide information. Sometimes you get more information from trying something different and it not working than you would from trying something you already know. And so failure itself may be not so interesting to me. What's interesting to me is variety and exploration. So trying out different things has been shown to improve the rate at which you learn and that's because we all have a tendency to rely on what we're familiar with and if you try the unfamiliar you get more information from those attempts. So making errors is a good thing. What other factors facilitate successful language learning? Does it all come down to talent in the end or can you get there with hard work? Not learning about culture while learning a foreign language just doesn't exist. It's impossible the two go hand in hand together and I think is very important because the reason why people learn foreign languages is not just for the fun of it. They do it because they want to talk to other people. They want to understand other people. They fall in love with you know, somebody who speaks that foreign language. They want to be able to talk to them. They want to be able to talk to the relatives of their loved ones or their lover. Or, and that's why people do it. So they learn it to communicate and therefore also to understand how they live and what they're about. There is no way you can just learn a foreign language just to learn the foreign language. Now apparently the best motivation that you can have for learning a language, the one that's going to get you there the fastest, is what's called extrinsic motivation, which means uh, some sort of motivation from outside. So for instance, if you're moving to a country in six months or a year, um, or you have um, you know, a, a spouse who's from that country and none of their family speaks English or something. In those circumstances, you have a strong extrinsic motivation to learn the language. But of course, not everyone has that. So the question is kind of how can you develop 
a stronger intrinsic motivation, some sort of motivation that comes from yourself and your own interests to learn a foreign language. And I think, I think finding that intrinsic motivation is a much longer process. It's about kind of learning about the language, learning about the countries that it's spoken in, and finding something in it that really grabs you and makes you want to do it. As soon as you start to realise that people say things in different ways, and they have different concepts for things, some of the most basic things that we have, like meals, the times of meals, what you eat at meals, what you call those meals, how you understand those meals. As soon as you start to learn another language, you, you have to engage with the idea um, that there is another culture um, that, that speaks that language. Um, and I think it's a really important moment for a language learner when they realise that actually this language isn't just something annoying written in a textbook to plague them with. It's actually a, a whole functioning system that people from another culture are, are using. Um, and that's a kind of light bulb moment when they, when they realise that. So you need to have the right environment, you need to have equipment, you need to have books. But I think what is underestimated generally is, is the human factor in language learning. Uh, I think it is very important for groups to have a, a relationship, a safe environment in which students feel that they can try out their new language. They need to feel uh, that they won't be ridiculed and making mistakes is part of it. The interesting finding that I've come across is that what we know about humour can actually help us to think about how we acquire language. So I think learning, the whole process of learning, actually learning anything, but let's keep it to language learning, ha has a lot in common with the process of, of getting a joke, particularly a wordplay joke in humour, where you have two opposing ideas, two opposing scripts, and you kind of need to put them together. And this is what happens in language learning. We've got two different languages and we need somehow to, to, to put them together. This has an affective side to it as well, um, and this does determine some of my approach to, to language teaching, which is the more you can have fun with the language, the more you can play with it, the more you can use it in incongruous, laughable, playful, silly ways, the better you learn, and partly because it's more fun, and partly because it means that making mistakes um, isn't such a isn't such a problem anymore because we're, we're, we're actually, we're, we're out at play. Mistakes are all right. Fun. You must really enjoy it. If you're motivated, work hard and are having fun, can things still go wrong? Are there factors that may affect language learning negatively? Can a classroom setting or your age hold you back? Will you get discouraged by how long it takes to become fluent? I think if students don't have some kind of enjoyment in motivation for learning, then we're probably we're not going to be going anywhere. I think lack of variety and lack of a willingness to be eclectic in your approach will probably affect language learning negatively because in a class different people work in different ways they have different learning styles they have they're at different stages so you know we have to make sure that we've got an eclectic range to to help all of them I think it's also really important as a language learner not just to follow a pattern that's set for you by a teacher or a, uh, a, a course um, you have to find what works for you, what motivates you to study the language, what types of things you enjoy doing that make language learning kind of more of a pleasure and less of a chore. So some people, for instance, will find that, you know, they, they do like sitting and doing grammar exercises. Other people would prefer to do a minimum of that and spend a lot of time, for instance, watching films or listening to music, or they prefer to just pick up a book or a newspaper and try to read as much of it as they can. Different things work for different people, and I think to, to make progress, you have to, you have to find that thing that's going to allow you to do it. In certain ways, young people acquire a language more quickly than older people, and you know, it has to do with the flexibility of your brain. But older people are much more conscientious learners, and therefore certain things they will do better. 
my suspicion is that older learners possibly are a little bit more fixed in the way that they say things and the way that they think about things. On the other hand, they've got a huge advantage. They have a wealth of life experience, of dealing with people, of communicating, of learning about other cultures. And that's actually also incredibly useful when you're learning a language. You can kind of leverage that. It's difficult to say how long it takes to learn a language because I don't think anyone knows what it means to learn a language in its entirety. Fluency is kind of like the horizon and it recedes as you approach it. So you can study a language for a year and you can be fluent in certain particular small areas of it, areas of it. So you can be fluent in the sense that you can go to a hotel, you can check into your room, you can go to a restaurant, order your food, pay for it, and you can accomplish all those daily tasks. So in that sense, you can be really fluent after just a year. But then if you wanted to go have a conversation with your friend about philosophy, um, you need a few more years for that. For each person, it progresses differently, kind of depending on um, who you are, um, how hard you work at it, and kind of what your natural inclinations are. I think there's a real myth of talent surrounding languages in English-speaking countries. So there's a belief that if you're talented at languages, then you're just going to do absolutely fine and you're going to get A's on everything. And if you're not talented, then you might as well just give up. And I think most people find a, a very good excuse to put themselves in that non-talented camp and just give up learning languages. The fact is that, especially I think the harder a language it, it is, the less talent matters and the more hard work matters. What would psychologists working on memory recommend to language learners? Are there ways in which we can hack our memories to make it easier for us to acquire a foreign language? A schema is a structure in memory, and the best structures in memory are ones that relate to things we already know. So it's much easier to add a piece of information to it a web of associations that you're already familiar with, then learn a, a new isolated fact and then create those associations. And so that means that the best structures within which to integrate new information are those that you create yourself. Not least because you're in there, you know, and it's personally relevant, and it's, there will be idiosyncratic associations that are only, only true for you, and so they'll be particularly easy for you to learn. If a teacher creates a structure, it may resonate for them, but it might not work as well for you. What other things can you do? What other factors are there that you can control how you practice, which will help you learn better? So one of those things is the spacing of your practice. Um, another is variety of your practice. So whether that means interleaving different kinds of practice or practicing, exploring during your practice. Those things are reliably associated with faster learning. It's more effective to practice retrieving the answer to a question than it is to simply rehearse looking at the, what the answer is. So even if you don't know the answer or you're unable to retrieve it, for your eventual learning of that answer to a particular question, it's better to practice trying to remember it than it is just to look at the question and answer pair together. Lots of experiments have shown that. The way you should do this is by reframing what you want to revise in terms of questions and answer pairs and practice providing the answer rather than what many of us do when we revise is just make a list of the things we want to learn and look at them and then think that by looking at them they're going into our memories in the most efficient way. They're not. This relates to that fallacy that we probably all experience when we've been studying or revising that we think if we want to remember something that will help us remember it. In fact, the experiments show that wanting to remember something, intending to remember something, doesn't provide a particular advantage over just remembering something because we happen to briefly pay attention to it, so-called incidental learning. What does provide an advantage is, if, is rearranging the material to fit it into a web of associations. So rather than trying to remember isolated facts, we need to make sense of them and relate them to other things we know. So paradoxically, it's easier to remember two things than one. And what would linguists who teach foreign languages recommend to learners? Are there ways in which we can make the classroom experience more real for language learners? And I think my, my biggest recommendation simply is invest 
in relationship with your students rather than just in your knowledge of the language. I think it pays off. In the end, the, the teacher can only do so much. Your biggest tool is encouraging. Your biggest tool is enthusing. If you manage to do that, they will do the legwork. You have about 5% of impact on knowledge, I think, and 95 on motivation. So that is the bit that I think we should tackle much, much more. That's not to say that you shouldn't study how the brain takes on languages. I think that's all very important. But it's a human communication thing. People will learn harder. People will try their better. People will be more hungry if they feel that what they do is rewarding. So invest in your students. We, we strive to the extent possible to introduce as much of what's called flipped learning as possible. Um, flipped learning is when we don't have an interaction that comes from the teacher simply presenting material and then the students kind of asking questions about it or using it, but waiting for things to come from the students and using them in the classroom. Fun! Making it fun! <laughs> yeah, making it fun! and making it lively. A language class needs to be lively. Sometimes it's a, sort of a bit slower and a bit of perhaps reflection and explanation and that sort of stuff is important. But students, they need to not necessarily enjoy it in that it always has to be a laugh, but they need to feel that they, they progress. And they progress when they're, they're enjoying it. So you've got to make sure that enjoyment is there and encourage them to enjoy themselves in it as well. So take away the sort of personal inhibitions that some of them have. We need to promote much more contact with native speakers. It is increasingly difficult to take young people um, to another country to give them any kind of immersive experience. So they have very little contact with the real world. Doing things like reading, watching films, listening to music can be a really important part of building that intrinsic motivation that you want to have, that motivation that comes kind of from inside, because it helps you find the things in that culture that are important for you, that make it important for you to learn that language. So I, I think it can be a real source of both li linguistic help, but it can also be very motivating for students to do that. You must also allow yourself to be guided by your own personality. So if a particular teacher instruction book says you must do this, but you really feel uncomfortable with that, you must never do it, because it isn't you. <laughs> Remain yourself. I think that's the most important thing. If you can just show yourself and, and show your enthusiasm through being yourself in class, I think that's, that's probably the best reflection of, of you as a teacher as well. My absolute sort of passion here is thinking about how we can improve language teaching, not so much in universities, but how we can improve it in our schools, because that's where young people have their first experience of, of language teaching. And I think the approach that we have in this country is pitiful and is failing young people, quite frankly. Um, so first of all, we, we need to devote more time to language learning. Students do not get enough hours in their timetable. I know that there are a lot of competing demands, but they don't get enough time to be exposed to the language. Um, linked to that is the status that we accord to language learning. Um, we, don't, we don't treat it as important. It is not compulsory for more than three school years. It's not seen as nearly as important as mastery of their own language or mastery of science and mathematics. To wrap up, we asked linguists, psychologists and language teachers to share with us their top tips for language learning. Let's see what they have to say. My top tips for learning would be that you need to explore because you learn a lot from your failures, especially if you don't rely too much on habit. Make mistakes. Make mistakes in front of the class. Make it okay. Make it even a good thing to make mistakes. Uh, because that's how you learn. You don't learn by getting it right, you learn by getting it wrong um, and then putting it right. Find your intrinsic motivation, so find the thing in that language or in that culture that is going to keep you learning it, that, that makes you want to keep learning it, because without that it's going to be a real slog. Just use the resources that you have available. Um, when I started learning foreign languages there wasn't an internet. I say to my students, you have so much more material you know, at your fingertips there. Go and use it and explore it. Take breaks so your practice is spaced out. It feels good to cram. 
So, you know, we've all done that the day before an exam, you brush everything, but actually it's more efficient if you've got five hours to revise for something to spend an hour a day, Monday to Friday, than to do five hours on Friday or five hours on Monday. It takes more organization, but it's more efficient. It, it's not about kind of studying everything in a, in a massive stretch, you know, for weeks on end, coming up to your exam. Um, language learning is about little and often. Don't sit down for two hours to learn your vocab lists, but do it in bursts of five or ten minutes, a few times a day. Practice producing the answers or using the vocabulary rather than just listening to it or rehearsing, recognizing it, because we over rely on recognizing things. That's not the same as being able to produce it. Study languages in context. Um, read newspapers. Newspapers are a great way to get started because they're short. They don't require a lot of cultural knowledge. Um, the language tends to be a little bit less complex than, than novels. But if you like fiction, try fiction. Listen to the radio, listen to the TV. Um, do, do tandem learning. Find a native speaker and speak to them occasionally. Um, change the settings on your phone or your iPad or your computer to be in that foreign language. Little and often getting these kind of signals from, from all kinds of places. So always offer, other than language, also cultural context. Dangerous thing to do, but it, it put, makes it lively. It puts it in, 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 in a real life situation. You need to vary how you practice. So not just trying new things, but the old things, which you do need to repeat and drill. You need to mix up the practice. So don't just do, you know, practicing, rehearsing what one word means 20 times and then another word 20 times won't be as effective as interleaving and practicing them together. Forget about talent. Don't give yourself a complex about talent. Um, talent really doesn't have much to do with whether you become a good speaker of, the, of a, a foreign language. Practice by teaching to others. Um, that really makes sure you know it. Make it fun. Make them see the magic of it. Make them see how exciting it is to use a different grammar, to use a different linguistic system, to use different words. It still makes sense. There is an affective side to language learning. If we're not having fun and we're feeling anxious about making mistakes, we're not going to want to produce the language and we're, it, we're not going to learn. It, it, it shuts down at, at really quite important levels um, our, our ability to be receptive and open to, to learning this new material and this new, this new behaviour, because I think it's, a lot of it is about language as a behaviour um, rather than a series of facts that, that we know. So we always have to quote Lenin and say, uchitsa, 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 which means learn, learn, learn. Hard work pays off. It honestly does with foreign language. It's the most important thing you can do. When you've had your first dream in your foreign language, then you know.